Oh, fuck it. It is on the camera. Hey. Uh, okay, we're clear. So I'm just going to move the camera. It's such good quality. Yeah. It could be to make my arms, even though they're not that big. How's that possible? Is this real life? Oh my goodness. Uh, you've all got there. Yeah. yeah. It's ridiculous. But it looks so tanned as well. It makes no sense. It must be all the uh, equipoise making me tanned. The red light, like you're at home, at home tanning studio. It's a new UV in that, you see. All right. I'm ridiculously tanned after my weekend of getting really burnt. You never really get burned, though. You get tanned immediately. Yeah. Oh, well, actually, the, um, the one thing that did burn you was the uh, welder. The welder burned the shit out of me, yeah. You moved the mouse off my face. It's just, you know, like, you know, when there's um, a crack the windscreen, you can't see anything but it. Welcome to another Q&A live stream. So we have some people online watching, which is great. Thanks very much. If you could let us know if the audio quality or the video quality is like good or bad or whatever it's like. And then if you wanted to throw up a few questions, we have a few questions from the last time. And we might just start hashing away through those, but I think there's some popping in already. What's Bo who's Boogenhagen? I was just literally just going Googling. I don't know who Boogenhagen is. Thanks, Aaron. We're trying to make the quality of these live streams a bit better because the um just using a normal webcam isn't ideal really. Uh, it's either a, a Final Fantasy thing. Oh, or this is your fucking fault again? Like I can't course. believe you put a Dungeons and Dragons no. reference. NPC is just any anyone who's ever played a video game in their life would know what that is. Dork. Eric Bugenhagen. Ricky Sticky Bugenhagen. A wrestler? Is he a wrestler? Uh, what's the crack? The crack is great. Um, Ricky Sticky Bugenhagen. I've just no idea. That's good. Audio. Is audio all right, Doman? Yeah. Hopefully the audio is good. We could run that mic as well if you wanted. Or we might do that the next day. Yeah. Oh, that's quite good. It's all right. Maybe another fresh routine, please. Myself and Gareth have been getting dental work done. Yeah, aggressive dental work. Aggressive dental work. Getting your teeth cleaned is the worst thing ever. Yeah. It's actually, do you know, they live like that drill thing. And they accidentally touch your, um, your fucking... Wait till you have to get your gums scraped out. I'll never get to that stage. We're just fixing the autofocus, by the way, if you're wondering what's, why Gareth's after disappearing. Uh, wanted to know if you guys have ever had major injuries and your, what your approach to coming back was. You sure have. I've had two major injuries, like two real, like two, two months that took me out of it. Um, definitely the longest one that really fucked me up was I tended up in my thumb, which sounds... Really benign. But that was, fucked you up for a long time. That fucked me up for about nine months, I'd say. Actually, no, I've had... No, that's not true. I've had about four major injuries, actually. Yeah. Now, now that I've thought about it for four and two seconds. Um, the first I had was, in 2015, I had two really bad shoulder injuries, and I got through them by ignoring it and just squatting five or six times a week. I couldn't lift a bar overhead. I actually couldn't even lift my arms overhead, to be honest. I couldn't do any work. <laughs> so you began the fridge. Well, probably. So I just did a load of squatting. Um, I, I've never, to this day, I don't know what the squat injury was, or the shoulder injury was. I have no idea what caused it. Uh, that happened twice in the same year on the same shoulder. So the first time, it was when I was low block snatching with 40. I made him, and then I destroyed my shoulder just immediately after. And then um, later that year, I hang snatched with 40, and that again murdered my shoulder. It took, yeah. me, it took me out for, like, I'd say a total of, like, four months of that year, if not more. Then I had like tendinopathy in my thumb. Um, voodoo flossing saved me there. Uh, I tendinopathy for like nine months, I'd say. I couldn't move my thumb in the morning, so like my thumb would be just rigid. And then also pre-2015, I'd say maybe like 2013 or 2012, I tore a rhomboid on either side within six weeks of each other, so I tore one side. 
that was crippling. That was probably the most debilitating towards general life. Because they couldn't put on, uh, there was like a student race day and they couldn't put on my own shirts. I could put on t-shirts and stuff very, very slowly, but I just physically couldn't put on my own shirts. I couldn't tell you. Um, most of them I just ignored, to be honest, except for the thumb tender happening moment I had to put some effort into fixing. But the others I just kind of ignored. Obviously, yeah. knowing what I know now, I could probably fix them a bit faster. But I, uh, yeah, that they would be major. There was a lot of injuries, actually, when you asked about it. Yeah, I've my had, head, yeah. If I stared at my feet, I've had full tears and ruptures on my right ankle on the lateral ligaments and ligaments on the outside. I've partial tear in my ACL on my right knee, meniscus tear in my ACL on my right knee, full quad tear in my vastus lateralis, six rib fractures. Have you had a quad tear? Yeah, I still, the bump is there. Fuck. Vulture fracture in my collarbone, six rib fractures, AC joint on my right and left shoulder, rotator cuff tear in my right shoulder, broken nose, more than 10 concussions. <clears throat> Uh, fracture into the discs of my neck. And that's it. Oh, do I have anything else? What about your knee? What's the thing with your knee? Oh, and I've got tendinopathy in my quadriceps tendon. So yeah, a few injuries. Injuries are the reason I'm in this whole mess that we call seeker strength. So I couldn't play rugby anymore and started lifting weights. Uh, non-player character. No. He's talking about non-player characters. It's oh. your dorky thing again. Every knows an NPC. It's like it's just like okay. Daniel Blackburn is saying, "Oh no, somebody said lean and mean." Yeah, Daniel Blackburn. Blind, right? Yeah, it's not really good. aggressively. Like you started off so confident. Yeah. Um, what is this? Uh, Ricky is a freaking goon. He recently tried to impress. Maybe it's him. Is it Eric Bungenhagen? I've done yeah. Could be him. Um, do you guys have a Premier League team that you support? I hate soccer. No, I no time for soccer, unfortunately. I hate everything about it. And I used to play soccer for a few years. No, just never. Soccer was just never a thing I was into. No. Uh, I think Zercher squats. I think unless you have to do Zercher squats for... Uh, basically for strongmen, I don't think there's any benefit to doing Zercher squats, basically. I think people use them because they're... They're really, 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 really easy to teach someone how to do. And someone with bad mobility and bad motor patterns can do them quite easily. So you see rugby strength and conditioning coaches using them a lot because most rugby players can't front rack a bar. If they back squat, they're not getting like any kind of anterior stuff because they just sit way back. So I think that's the place I've seen them use. And to be honest, I don't really like them. Uh, voodoo flossing is when you wrap you get those basically a resistance band that's like just a one long length and you wrap it around its compression and that was the only thing that ever helped it helped basically straight away when i took a couple of weeks i just wrapped it and hung from a pull-up bar um and it really like freed up the tendon along there but i tried everything else I tried like dry needling um fucking massage ice hot what other did i try uh other kind of you tried fucking everything yeah nothing worked on it except for the, the voodoo thing I think voodoo fasting is good because it's like cross fiber friction, so particularly in the forearm where you can't really stretch your forearm too much. It, it like mashes things. Connor says he must mostly be duct tape. A lot much. of duct tape, yeah. A lot of duct tape and callus. You used to be a lot more broken before. It's yeah. Been way broken. And mentally as well. That <clears throat> uh, doesn't seem like a genuinely troll question, but super total in MMA. I, I love it. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> the fact that you you know yourself, um, Daniel. If you say it's just going to seem like a troll question, it's definitely like the super total would probably help your MMA, but you MMA definitely won't help your super total, and you're not going to be very good at either of them. Um, but do you know what could actually work well is if you wanted to do like MMA as your sport, and then as your off season from MMA, you did some two super total programming. That would be quite good because you get strong and pretty fast and kind of athletic. Yeah, but MMA and combat sports never take off seasons. Yeah, which they never do. But they should learn something from that. No, that just, maybe no. taking off seasons would be know, a good thing. So when they take an off season in MMA, until they tear like a ligament in their knee or their back, and then that's their off season yeah. while they're trying to recover. Um, it's the only ones you ever see them doing. Nutrition question: Our personal specialty. <laughs> <laughs> um, so eat less during a deload week. It depends what you're trying to do. To be honest, most of the time in training, like 
changes or like your priority driven nutrition is is what does it not so much your training volume so like if you're eating to gain weight you eat to gain weight all the time and it doesn't really rely on your training um i know some people fluctuate calories with rest days and training days that's fair enough but to be honest i think if you want to be a good athlete just be super consistent with the amounts you're eating and the kinds of food you're eating eat the same thing every day don't worry too much about like fluctuations up and down during on weeks and off weeks i think um so like the thing there is if you're trying to if taking deload it means you're trying to recover from training so reducing your calories would be adverse conditions to recovering so it wouldn't make sense to eat less food while you're deloading if you're trying to recover uh i would say as well the chances are if you're worried about fat gain from the deload week or from the less calories burned realistically you don't burn that many calories unless you do a high intensity and a high intensity a highly endurance specific sport so if you're doing stuff like you know triathlon um a lot of field sports a lot of running anything like that so anything like high cardiovascular demands then you might have one issue but if you're doing that most of the time you're probably not fat anyway so i wouldn't imagine it's an issue paul so i would say unless um no there's actually probably never a time to that you would eat less food because you're deloaded so you might be eating less food because you are doing a cut or whatever for other reasons but it would never be i'm doing a deload so i don't need as much calories if anything you need the same or a little bit more calories um okay bicep tendonitis on the inside of the elbow doing wide bench what to do it's pretty common yeah um I, mostly it's for that so obviously you can try the generic thing so um you know rolling you can try the flossing trigger point therapy mobility but realistically probably for that thing it's a uh, it's a pretty adverse angle for your elbows and the tendons mm. involved. So realistically, the only thing that will kind of reduce the pain on that is just kind of reducing the amount of benching you're doing. And so if it's causing an issue now, you need to build, to build up a tolerance for that. And obviously, there's a lot more that goes into that, but that's more of a load thing rather than a, it's either change your grip fully, change your bench style, or, um, you know, just kind of put up with it, I suppose. I'm more like, when people wide grip bench, I think people make the mistake of, their grip is out so wide and they get into this kind of position. If you take the rule of thumb that you never want your wrist to deviate from being over your elbows, you're going to be a hell of a lot better off. So even when you are wide grip benching, your elbows follow yourself out and you never get into this kind of really overarched position will be much that like that's a much better technical model for you to learn how to bench press with. A great way of learning those movements a small bit better is to go and do floor pressing for a while or maybe floor press once a week for a while. And you'll get to see that because once your elbows hit the ground, it's very, very easy to see what that angle is like or what the relationship between your wrist and your elbow is like. And that will get rid of that pain almost immediately. Um, so is there one about? Oh, uh, where are we? Um, okay. How much progress should you expect to make within 10 years of solid training? This is like how long is a string, piece of string? That's like impossible to answer. It's like, it's a strength training, is a, you know, power of thing, weight of thing. Like there's no... There um, is absolutely no way of knowing. You could make more progress in a year, within your first year of training, than Gurf has made within 10 years or 15 years of training. You just absolutely do not know until you start training, start seeing what your physiology is like, what your genetic structure is like, what your psychology is like. Uh, how much you're willing to stick to things or sacrifice things, you've absolutely no way of knowing. I will say, 10 years of training, you should get uh, good numbers. Yeah. If, if you're, you're intelligent. Unless you're genetic mush. Unless you're like genetic dog shit. Stop pointing at me. I wasn't pointing at you. I, I can see that. No, 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 no. That was you. I can see that. You were projecting on yourself. I saw that. I was just. They saw it too. Like, you just, were like, unless no, you're genetic dog I was shit. Italian gesticulating for dog shit. I don't know why. Are you guys ever going to react to 2019 96 class that tied me? Oh, that's actually a great question. Yeah. Literally, do you have the post it note? Uh, yeah. No, it's on our media master sheet. So we're either going to do the 2018 96s or the 2019. But the sorry, 2019 sorry, sorry, sorry. is the one we wrote down. Sorry, the 20. We were going to do the 2019 or 2018 96s. So I think we might go. We were going to do the 2018 ones, I thought. I think we have 2019 right now. Okay, if we have 2019 right now, we're going to do it. So obviously. Basically, we've, we've recorded, we recorded two attempts at the uh, reaction commentaries, but we just, there was no vibe, like we just weren't, we picked really bad times because we were under a lot of pressure doing stuff. Yeah. And so like we were trying to move to the office and it was back when we just finished up 
with the lockdown. So we're trying to do a lot of weather work and we wanted to get them done. But then we realized that we were doing them like after a lot of weather work or under a lot of pressure. And obviously that doesn't make for good vibes for a reaction one. So uh, we've decided this week though, tomorrow we're just going to record one and we're going to do it. I think we're, it was funny. It's either that or 2018-96s. Um, and so we'll probably do the 2019 ones. Um, okay, Matt has a question. I was wondering about the inflammation thing, that whole thing of inflammation. Did you miss? Uh, oh, did I? Sorry. New, a junk food eater, newbie here, getting over 160 on my back squats. Is a good idea to buy some lifting shoes? Can you send us a link to your back squats? I'm going to say yes anyway. Yeah, you should have lifting shoes anyway if you're squatting loads. But it would be great if you could send us a link to your back squat. We can take a look at your back squat. And we could possibly tell you what kind of weightlifting shoes would work best for you. Absolutely. Um, if Junk Food Eater, if you could pop a link down below and we'll have a look. Also, if anyone, obviously an Instagram or YouTube link. Um, but if anyone is wondering, we've got some space left for the master class on this Saturday for the back squat. So June the 5th, 3 p.m. GMT plus one or just 3 p.m. Irish Standard Time um, because we have different time zones if it's summer or not. You know <laughs> Because the island moves, you see, because it, when it gets warm. I wish it would stop doing that. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah. So my, my default answer is if, if we don't get to your squat, junk food eater, the answer is probably almost certainly yes. Yeah. Uh, okay, Matt, maybe to get to your question. I was wondering about the inflammation thing. Uh, it's linked to all these problems like arthritis, but you said it's good for recovery. If people are finding correlation between X and blood flow, they will likely find many spurious correlation. So this, can I, I'll just, a little quick point, not really to do with the question. This brings up a, a kind of broader point, Matt, in the fact that what's good for sports and what's good for performance and what's good for being an athlete necessarily does or doesn't necessarily always link in with what's the best thing for you having a long, healthy, pain-free life. Most people who train really, really hard and push, like, I'm thinking particularly about powerlifters and weightlifters with this, push things incredibly hard, are going to have long-lasting issues popping up, right? So it's very, very likely that you'll have arthritic issues with wrists, elbows, shoulders, knees, hips, whatever it is, and that's just part of you being an athlete and part of you accepting that you're training quite hard now and it's going to have some effect down the road, right? I've no doubt that that's just going to be part of it. The inflammation thing is a kind of interesting side note to this because when we're saying you want to promote inflammation, you're promoting inflammation that's happening due to you bringing in a very specific stimulus, right? So if I go to the gym and I squat and I have some level of inflammation in my quads or my glutes or my hamstrings, I want that inflammation to be there because that inflammation is, or I have brought in a stimulus to cause the inflammation to bring about an adaptation. The issue a lot of the times with these kind of autoimmune issues and, and arthritis and all of that kind of area and inflammation is that that is coming from systematic inflammation. So whether that is through poor lifestyle, poor diet, uh, a host of other factors like genetics, when those things come into it and it's systematic and it's there for ages or it's there for a huge amount of time, that then becomes chronic inflammation and the body has to deal with that chronic inflammation through actually adapting itself, not through simply turning on a hormone cascade, bringing about an adaptation, and then going back to baseline again. Um, also, so thank you. Do you do that one? You just go really far. Also, I'm like, way yeah. tighter on this side than I am on that side. Do you feel a blocking in there? No, I feel a blocking in there. here. That's what it is. The spiders? The spiders? You want the spiders? Uh, so I think probably the main problem with the inflammation thing is probably the use of the word like the vernacular used when people say inflammation so inflammation is given a blanket statement in terms of uh it's a it's application on everything you know so uh, in the in the um, situation where you talk about inflammation for arthritis that would be correct you know but there's different levels of inflammation different m multiple different cellular pathways different things involved in different parts of your immune system inflammation uh, there's many different reasons for how it's there, how it's gotten rid of, how it happens. So I think probably the, the issue is that when people say information, they just say information as a blanket statement rather than using information in a specific context. Uh, some of it would be as yet unknown, I suppose, and some of it would be people don't understand 
the specifics of it, I suppose. Um, Jason saying, "Twin the hunting vlog dropping." Um, probably never. Yeah, probably never. Um, it's just it wouldn't be good f for us. The issue with YouTube and the fact that we use YouTube so much is that us getting flags or markers against us isn't very positive. Also, Ireland isn't the kind of country where you can just la -di da introduce somebody to a firearm and be like, oh yeah, here, this is a gun. But even if Things we did are ourselves, strict over here. I don't know, would we be putting ourselves at risk for yeah. no good reason? Um, for, we'd be doing, obviously, there'd be nothing illegal with doing a vlog, but we'd be definitely exposing ourselves to potential situations that just would be not good for our licenses, basically. We'll definitely do like butchering videos and stuff next year. Yeah, maybe we might do a vote one. Yeah. Uh, what cool. are your thoughts on NO, so nitric oxide boosters, like deep root ultra? Okay, so last year, weirdly enough, I just had a notion to look into some of these, right? So just for, just randomly wanted to see what the story was, as, as I always do with just most years, I would look at stuff randomly, see if it has any impact in training. Um, so I looked at the research. There's a good bit of research that says that the nitrogen oxide boosters do stuff in recovery. Um, you, I'm going to assume, no, maybe not going to assume, but it's possible you've seen Chris Duff and come at you with this, with the uh, Vaso Blitz was the company they and I tried their products. Um, yeah. um, basically, it just doesn't do anything. Uh, it doesn't do anything meaningful from what I saw from it. I tried it for a reasonable period of time. Um, Chris Duff and talks about them. Like they were, game, he said them that they're game changing for him. Um, given the amount of performance and drugs Chris has used, that's it's definitely not true from the outset. There's no possible way he could have compared um, some nitric oxide boosters from the plethora of performance anti drugs he used. Uh, not taking shots at Chris, but just being honest with you, you know, it's kind of bullshitty. Like on a uh, on a funny note or an entertaining note from that, yeah, you can find the supposed stack Chris often used to do. Yeah, was it a double or a triple out of thousand pounds? Um, and if you're like, if you've any kind of, any kind of moderate interest in like foreign dancing drugs for strength sports, that list is horrifying. So even if, even if, you know, it's half of that list, like you would have never have noticed, he said they were like a game changer for him. You know, so much difference, which I, I don't believe to be true, but he's the only person I've ever heard notably talk about, uh, in no boosters. Um, I think the, the beat root extract one. I don't think there's, I haven't looked into it too much, but I'm, I, I don't think it's, um, it becomes meaningful unless you take a lot of it. So I would say I probably wouldn't chase that rabbit if I was chasing rabbits for stuff like that. Saxon has a question for you. Go on. It says, Biochem honors now studying physiotherapy. Any crossovers that you find interesting? Peptides question mark. Is there any crossovers between physiotherapy and biochemistry? Um, yeah. No. Um, I think biochemistry is a good, like, you have to have an understanding of biochemistry before you would look at. I would have hated to have done physiotherapy. Oh my God. I would have hated We shared this. a lot of modules in um, yeah. our second and third year with the physiotherapist. Mm -hmm. And there's like an inherent hatred between our stream of study and physiotherapists. Mm -hmm. uh, but I hated their course. Anyone I knew doing physiotherapy as well was pretty sad about doing physiotherapy by the yeah. end of the fourth year. Um, I don't, I don't know. There's no, no particular one jumping to my mind. Um, maybe I'm just like, yeah, maybe just tainted by so, seeing so many bad physios in real life, or some of them are just not useful. Um, I know I can't, I can't think off the top of my head anything that springs to mind in regards to the crossover between the two of them. Uh, the only crossover I know I would do is I would never do it, but that's just entirely personal preference. Uh, okay, Dark Material says, how much ab work would you include for powerlifting and how would you structure it to not limit your main lift during the week? Uh, in terms of the how much to include, I probably include ab work on every session or some sort of midline stability work, so it's not all ab work. I include it on every session for most of the powerlifters we coach and it's in almost every session on the powerlifting blocks. The way you structure it to not limit your main lifts is the same way you structure all other accessory work. So you plan out and program all of your main lifts, then do exercise selection. So whether that's your needs analysis or however you select your exercises, spread those exercises out throughout the course of the week in a way where they won't conflict or they won't overlap with each other. 
And then in terms of overall volume and overall intensity, just start low and build from there. Uh, starting at four sets of 30 seconds on a fully extended plank, it's probably a fairly good place to note if that's very difficult for you. Start with very low volume on the rest of your exercises. If that's pretty okay for you, just start with moderate volume. <clears throat> Uh, Mad says, I've had crazy sore quads just above the knee in the teardrop for a couple of weeks, disappears from rolling and then comes back. Any tips? So I thought I didn't give you the answer. Usually when we have injury questions, unless it's something we've had ourselves, you know, which we'll talk about, but for anyone else's stuff, it's just not possible for us to diagnose injury stuff over the internet. Uh, not for us. I'm sure there's people out there who could do it through a series of, like, symptom tests, but um, we don't. We don't really have that expertise, just like the nutrition thing. But um, I would say the best bet is always go see someone in person who can kind of do some diagnostics on you and see what happens. Uh, Alizar Melendez says, uh, biggest mistakes in training for Super Bowl, uh, not taking enough gear. <laughs> uh, we're going to win there. Uh, <laughs> go on, give me a serious answer. The serious answer for me is they're not doing... They, people don't do enough of the specific lifts. So they'll do like loads of snatch derivatives, clean and jerk derivatives, box squats, deadlifts from pins. They don't practice their actual lifts. Uh, that's when I've seen people doing super total training. That is the issue they do. They do like loads of power snatches and loads of jerks from behind the neck. Whereas with super total, you need to be even more specific due to the fact you have limited time with the lifts themselves. You have something super total, do you? Yeah. To be honest, like super total training in my head is mostly weightlifting, but just with bench, basically. Is there weight weightlifting with a, like a like a Russian emphasis on deadlifts, maybe? And then you do some bench, but you do bench with the the aim of improving bench would be my thought process behind this. Um, but I'd say probably I would say a lot of people want to do super total before they're Done. A, they've done enough training for either of those to do legitimately. So I only have one person on super total. Yeah, it's the same. Yeah. So usually, I think when people do super total training, they try to do um, do powerlifting and weightlifting together as opposed to super total training. So they try to do all their powerlifting and their weightlifting, having not been very very good at weightlifting currently, and then they'll try and do all the powerlifting stuff. So I would say if you're coming at a super total program yourself, I would say think about it as you're a weightlifter who does bench. And then you'll be able to lay out program a lot more productive because the lifts won't really impact your your super the other lifts or your squat bench and deadlifts, but your squat bench and deadlifts will massively impact the other way around. So you'll be back squatting anyway if you're doing a good weightlifting program, so that should be covered. You'll almost certainly be doing some kind of deadlift anyway, so you just make that a little more focused, and then you just need to put in a bench in an area uh, where it makes sense and where it least impacts you, and you mitigate the negatives from benching that might have on weightlifting. So I would say. My idea would be come at it from a weightlifting perspective, set up a good weightlifting program, then see have you enough squat bench and deadlifts, and then see how much of your weightlifting can you take away, and then add in squat bench and deadlifts a little bit more. Wow. Right. Plasma asks, can you give tips on how you would combine climbing and strength training, overhead press, deads, and squat, and kettlebell training? Awesome content, guys. Yeah, we've done a few climbing questions in the last few weeks. Yes. But... Where you start off with, like everything else, is you make sure you set out your priorities. So climbing is your, I'm going to assume, like your main priority, your main sport. Set that up as like you have three, four, five, six climbing sessions a week. Then just work out what's the minimum effective dosage of strength training is where I would go with that. Probably three sessions a week of strength training, maybe two. And then the only other place I'd look really is like your exercise selection and volume overall and making sure that exercise selection isn't going to directly affect your ability to climb the next day or later on that day. I'd be looking at uh, dumbbell rows, barbell rows, uh, single arm dumbbell press, Turkish get-ups, split squats, I would think. You often see them with their adverse angles for their legs. would be a lot of them. Obviously, back squats, uh, deadlifts, wouldn't be uh wouldn't be like it wouldn't have to be there if you want other stuff and um, weighted pull-ups would be definitely something you'll be looking at for the kind of the climbing specific specific stuff and then i think front squats would be a good one so uh, one thing i would really note on climbing stuff is that 
repetitive strain injuries seem to be quite high among climbers. Yeah. And I would make sure you're not doing things in the gym that you're going to get training from on the wall or in the climbing gym anyway. Just stay away from things like uh, loads of volume on pull-ups. Like things that could be very valuable in terms of specific climb training might be like uh, pronated or supinated grip, heavily weighted pull-ups or chin-ups, uh, heavily weighted hangs, things like working towards gymnastic progressions, whether that be like a planche or a flag or something like that. But just be conscious when you are doing those specific movements that you really don't want to be stressing the things that are already probably super stressed. Um, okay, Guam says, thanks, guys. No, Guam, thank you. Uh, okay, now, do you have any work experience advice? Trying to get into industry and looking for something over the summer, where do you reckon it would be best to try from gyms, physios, contacting coaches? I have a bit of an opinion on this. I have no opinion on this. You need to find the best gym within, like, within realistic distance for you, so probably like an hour from where you live. You need to find the best gym with the best coaches, and then you just need to go there and work for them for free for as long as you possibly can. Everyone has to do it. Everyone has to give their pound of flesh. You need to just be around those people. It doesn't have to be an internship program. It doesn't have to be you shadow coaching or anything like that. You literally just need to be in the company of other people you will have to mop floors you probably have to clean toilets but you like don't do some half-ass internship in a gym where you're taking some shitty pt's clients for him because he doesn't want to train them and you get to coach them and you're getting experience and you might get five or ten euro an hour like go to places with actual intelligent coaches work there for free as much as you possibly can and you will gain a hell of a lot more than being like a pseudo PT for three or four months. Uh, Mark says, should you mask up say should your back squat sense be the same as your front squat and overhead squat sense? Uh, so your back squat sense will be somewhat similar to your front squat sense, but the front squat will be slightly different. There'll probably be more toes out in your front squat. Your back squat will be slightly more toes forward and not too much, and probably be a little bit wider. Uh, then your front squat, your front squat will be a little bit closer, and then your overhead squat will be toes out a lot wider than others. So imagine my hands as feet, and we'll give you an idea. So back squat will probably be somewhere like here, slightly toes out, depending on anatomy. Front squat will be a little bit closer, uh, toes out, and then overhead squat will be out here and toes out realistically. The difference between all three of those, though, is tiny for most people. Yeah, there is a difference yeah, yeah. if you're asking a question. Uh, okay. Matt says thanks. No problem, Matt. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Hanshin O. Hanshin O. Nailed it. How do you gauge if you're doing too much accessory work? Accessory work is optional in my current Olympic weightlifting program, but I don't want to hamper progress from doing too much. Sounds like you need a new program if it's optional. How do you optional accessory work? I would say answer your, I'm going to answer your second part and you can take how much you should be doing. Yeah. But uh, I would say most people need lots of assistance work in a weight of thing. Most people don't have strong upper backs, don't have a lot of stability, don't have a lot of connection with their particular muscle groups, so they don't have enough to do the particular positions or hold strength in particular positions. Uh, a lot of times, like the assistance work also gives you a connection with that muscle group, gives you a little bit more intuition with it so you can control it better and prime it a little bit better if you're smart about it. Stability. Um, my answer to that one is it should never be optional, ever, ever, never, never. Not for amateurs. Uh, unless you're taking an absolute go all of gear, then you can probably get away with it, as like Bulgarians would do or some other countries. But if you're a, a natty amateur lifter, Hanshin, you should be doing at least, you should be doing accessory work at least twice a week, I would say. Twice. Twice. Uh, if you look at overall loading, I think your specific training and specific lift should take around 50% of your total, like you can break this up by minutes, right? 50% to 60% of your total time should be taken up with specific lifts. Then you can talk about probably 20 or 30% of your time being taken up with strength lifts or strength training, which might be deadlifts, squats, and presses. And then accessory work, like pure accessory work, it's probably another 20% on the end of that. Um, when you know you're doing too much, when you know you're doing too much might just
just be poorly programmed accessory work. But when you go to do your full lifts the next day or the next session and there is negative side effects hanging around, right? So if I've been doing like dumbbell rows or dumbbell bench press and when I go to jerk the next day, my overhead position is super tight and no matter how much I warm it and stretch it up, it's just overly fatigued, then I know I've done too much. That could be just moved to a different day and I could still do the exact same amount, but it's, it's more intelligently programmed. So that's what I would say. Just look for those places where it's kind of bleeding over into the next day. And then if it can't be intelligently pushed around the place, you might just be doing too much. It's like it's your screen. Anyway, you <clears> see, <throat> is it because it's there? Mine, uh, mine is whatever it's emitting from it. It's polarized it. Uh, in the low, no, where are you going? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Go back up, buddy. Jesus. Uh, it wasn't clear. Um, RTM says, I meant progress after 10 solid years of training. Matt says, what kind of training? Great question, Matt. Just wait a thing. So basically, uh, what the Russians are saying, so in Medi's book, um, the lighter class lifters get about 12 to 14 years on average um, of like progression. Now, I'm not sure was that from when they started uh, or was it kind of from a certain age once they hit like masters. So I, I think it was kind of once you kind of hit late puberty. So when you hit like your late teens, and then it's like 12 years, 12, 14 years from that are then the super the heavier group so like above 90 hundred kilos um mo it's like 15 to 17 years of progress so the heavier you are the uh, more progress you make or the longer it take you to keep progressing as well essentially now that's not hard and fast obviously they took a lot of drugs obviously in practice but their data their data their data their data is still good their data are still good Great, thanks, man. I'm nine years old. That's <laughs> not Oh, I love it. Oh, it's so nice. Oh, yes. Uh, probably not. Oh, okay. In the low bar squat, is it okay to start with the bar over your heels, then lean forward so it's over the midfoot, then descend, or should the bar always be over midfoot? The issue here is right. Forward, like forward trunk lean in the low bar back squat happens and it has to happen because of the way you shift your hips back my issue when people start molesting that process Jesus Christ. Don't say that again. my issue when people start messing around with that process is that usually the weight starts at our midfoot in a low bar back squat or anytime we have wear in our back the weight is usually starting around the midfoot and it's now in a low bar it's going back towards our heels and it's going laterally outwards so why would you start with the weight on your heels? It doesn't really make any sense. What's probably happening here is you're probably standing there with the bar on your back, you're leaning back, you're doing that, tucking the hips under that like really tight contraction, then leaning forward and pushing your weight forward. To be honest, I'd just like to see it a small bit more static and with slightly less moving parts. So start with the weight on your midfoot and move it back laterally so out towards the outside of your feet and towards the heels as you sit down uh, gunner says great name uh how important is warming up for weight training for injury prevention and the answer is very 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 important but actually warming up so we often talk about warming up uh not in terms of like doing your mobility so warm up to people means like rolling on a foam roller or doing some half ass uh, case me ass stretches what you're really not doing is actually warming up your core body temperature uh, from what I'm aware, most of the consensus is the only thing that will definitely can definitely help prevent injury is actually warming up your core body temperature. You're still wearing the fucking sunglasses. Yeah. You, you look like you're always fucking bringing me down. No, 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 no. I'm Honestly, always yeah. doing this. You do this at seminars as well. You always attack me. You try to make me. You try to belittle me in front. At the seminars, it's funny. Like, like take off your fucking. No one gets it. I can't read the screen now. Do you? Oh yeah, you you can put on your glasses, but I can't. You look like Shane McGowan. <laughs> yeah, but I can't take off my. I can't. I can't wear glasses. Why did you answer the again. question? Uh, but yes, warm up is incredibly important, Gunner. It's uh, massively important. Uh, it's one of the only things most, I suppose, injury people would agree on. Yeah, this is better. Warm up number one. Oh, that's much better. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thoughts on doing muscle power or muscle cleans and snatches with dumbbells if you're just a recreational lifter. If you're a lot more user friendly. The, re <laughs> the real issue here is what are you trying to get from power cleans and power snatches? If you look at the forehead on the if 
this with the on the neck is hilarious. On the neck is so much better. Uh, okay. The issue here is right. What are you trying to get out of muscle cleans and muscle snatches? So if you're like a a tennis player or a golfer or a rugby player and you want to get more powerful, get the powerful hip opening, get the triple extension you might get from the Olympic lifts, then by all means continue on, right? But a lot of the time what you're going to find is that you're severely limited. So in a, a movement like the power clean especially, you want to have a sufficient loading there where you're working within the power output bracket. So power output is like the the maximum or max power output is the maximum rate at which work can be done. So you might be just limited by the actual weight of the dumbbells or your ability to hold on to a heavy dumbbell. For a lot of people, like holding on to a 45 kilo dumbbell in each hand while doing a hang power clean is going to be very, very difficult, whereas you'd easily be able to power clean 90 kilos. Um, obviously, if you're just a, a recreational weightlifter and you're thinking about practicing with dumbbells, don't. It's a terrible idea. There's no point in doing it. You don't know if you can easily power clean it. No, I'm saying, like, if somebody who can power clean 45 kilos in each hand yeah. can definitely easily. Just assuming things will be blown as long. So what they say about assuming. Thanks, Nat. So you and me. Hey. Um, I'm after fun. losing where we are now. So back to Gunnar again. Uh, also, is there value in mobility work outside of weight training for intervention? Uh, yes, definitely. But the important thing is, it has to be mobility work specific to you. So a generic mobility stuff probably won't prevent the injuries unless, well, you will if you do enough. So if you get enough blanket mobility and you hit all the areas, then you might prevent those injuries. Um, there's a couple of like blanket things you can do, like test stuff, like so uh, maybe like single leg squats and overhead carries, and you'll kind of expose a lot of areas. You need to from side to side. But the, the, the important thing is, the mobility work has to be specific to your issues and not just any mobility work. Sorry, and you said test stuff. I thought you were talking about different things. Uh, how good is unilateral work like Bulgarian split squats at maintaining squat strength when you can't squat due to back injury? I don't know. It's good, right? It, it will do something. It's obviously not ideal. But if you can't squat due to a back injury, what you need to get is a dick belt or a weightlifting belt and hang a chain off it. And you can do pretty damn heavy belt squats which are superb for maintaining back squat strength when you can't back squat due to back injury. Uh, Dmitry Nazarkov says, hello, nice live stream. Sounds like a... No, Simba. no, 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 he said, have a nice stream. That sounds like a threat. <laughs> have a nice stream. Yeah. Uh, Simba says, a catching live stream finally. Hey. Should the idea of specificity of movement and the fact that training for increased power output, should you avoid sets and do slight levels of fatigue, you apply things like punching, Yes. Yes. Uh, yes, absolutely. This My be, God, this Ian is, Jackson, you're on the ball. You've won already. This one Thank we, God. This one we've been fucking seeing in all these cross <laughs> and spider things is like, um, so like you, you'd want to, so like the, the issue there with punching, right, is that when you lose power, it's not that you have, uh, probably really, it's not really that you change stuff to be slow, so you're running out of cardiovascular conditioning, right, but you need to build up that conditioning separate from the power training, you know? So uh, the probably thing is all the power as well from punching is that the differences in power are fairly minute uh, in terms of like, but people will think of this in terms of like back squatting or doing jumps, you know, you can you can visibly see that difference in jumping out of a box or you can see the difference in power clean 100 to 120, you know, you can see the, the and you're, you can visualize that power, you know? But when you are doing stuff like um, boxing training stuff, whatever, when you're training specifically for your punching, you're trying to improve your punching and not your boxing as a whole, just your punching, never ever do any plyometric or speed work. And that goes for punching under any kind of fatigue. Uh, you need to build up a tolerance to it. Um, you won't get, you, you won't, the, the issue with power training, right, is that there's no super compensation in power training. It's not like strength, it's not muscular strength. It's not, um, it's not like building up muscle. What you're doing is, uh, the speed of the movement dictates which muscle fibers are recruited. So if your punching goes from a specific speed and you're recruiting type 2A fibers and you're punching, um, you will recruit those. But as soon as you get fatigued and your movement slows down, then you'll start looking at different types of fibers or different like uh, uh, combinations of those. So the speed of movement that dictates what you're doing. So once you get fatigued, you stop recruiting those fibers. And then over time, then you start very, very slowly, not very slowly, but changing the portion of muscle fibers you have from fast, which is what you want, 
Um, because they're the most powerful because they punch the fastest. Slowly change those to type uh, type one slower fibers, which is no bueno. And then Ian says, because typically all boxing training is done like it's just conditioning. That's due to poor education. It's not the boxer's fault either. No. That's what we're saying. It's the uh, very, 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 coaching very poor coaching structures. Uh, okay. Saxon asks, do you guys have an email newsletter with... Eamon definitely made him say this. With Facebook Street <laughs> videos. No, we don't. But our website guy, our technical genius, uh, keeps telling us we need to do one. So it will come at some point when Shane McGowan next week takes off his sunglasses. Um, but if you're looking at papers every Monday, except for this Monday, the first Monday, yeah. we had like six months where you didn't do a paper review, but that was... Uh, I think it's your fault. But uh, next month... It wasn't my fault. We'll be back next Monday. Eric. What did we do? Oh, Vadim's video. Vadim, yeah. Vadim. Vadim, sorry. Um, so we normally, every Monday, we do the pay-per-view anyway, but I'm sure you know that, Saxon, if you if you were a YouTube regular. Hashtag friend of the podcast. Uh, okay. Drugs are bad. What, is, what is less healthy? Living a sedentary life or being a professional weightlifter for 15 years with no ped use and having an active life for 15 years? Hang on. Mark... If you're trying to ask us if you should take drugs, just come out and say it, right? Don't be fucking, don't be attacking, like, don't be No, well, he's saying no ped use. Oh, no ped, oh, he said ped use. What professional weightlifters don't use ped? Uh, that's what I was assuming. See, that was my fault. That's what I, I assumed that as well. I jumped it on. Um, what is healthy? Living like, the, the thing about health is, like, health is a range, like, health is a very broad and dynamic range. So you might have somebody who's incredibly healthy. They might have a very, very, uh, they might fit within like the brackets of BMI, their cardiovascular health might be very good, but physically the structure in which they move around, they might be damaged or mentally they might be damaged. So I wouldn't, I would say this, I'd say definitely the sedentary life is definitely less healthy for sure. Yeah. If, but then you like, yeah, less healthy. But if after five years you're in a wheelchair. No, but that doesn't happen though. Like, you know, well, on average, being a professional weightlifter without head use doesn't happen either. And it does like this. You just don't win anything, you know. But it would definitely, if you're a professional weightlifter, no ped use. You might have, you'll have some always after weightlifting for sure. But in terms of uh, longevity or active life, you definitely have um, a better time doing weightlifting because you're only going to train like two times a week or whatever. So if you're like, uh, Dimitri wants to know: Do we know about Clarence's challenge road to beating 321 kilos? We do, yeah. Um, so I think Clarence he was going really well. He said. And then he had a little bit of back owie. I don't know. He did 280 there recently, you see, on his patron. Mm. On his patron. Uh, so uh, we're going to see him next weekend, weekend after. With Seek his strength on tour. Seek strength on tour. We're going to visit. Stand by for the vlog. We're going to visit Clarence. So um, we'll ask him about it then. James says, what's up? Not much. It's up, James. Uh, Juan. 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 Yeah, that's what I wanted to say. <laughs> Uh, injury prevention for volleyball players mostly quick direction changes and landing from a height overall shoulder or yeah overall shoulder health a lot of overhead in the game they get a lot of shoulder injuries in volleyball I'd assume so they get a lot of shoulder injuries in badminton and it's basically badminton without a racket so what you need to start looking at here is you can do a fundamental movement screening which will get a lot of the stuff in the lower body particularly for the change of direction stuff the landing from a height stuff that's what you should be looking at is like, what are the structures like? What is your stability like? So a fundamental movement screening will look at all of those things. You should be looking at overall strength. So making sure you have a strong set of legs under you, having a double body weight squat would be great. And then things for overall shoulder health, like when you're getting in the gym, look at the actual range you have in your shoulder. Like, can you lock out your elbow overhead? A lot of people will be like quite restricted in the overhead position. Do men play volleyball? Yeah, they do, yeah. They're huge as well. Have you ever seen professional volleyball players? There's only one kind of volleyball I like watch. Uh, so yeah, when you're in the gym, making sure the range of motions are, are healthy and then just training them applicably. Uh, so on the quick change of directions and landing from heist, so the big thing, if you look at like rugby studies, whatever, when there comes to change or change of direction or, or COD, if, if, as they like to say, for their made up acronyms, is... All your dark friends never going to think you call it with Call of Duty. Oh, how do you know what that is? Exactly. So COD comes from uh, strength training, you know, so your ability to resist forces. So if you imagine when you're lunging in one direction and then you're trying to stop, you're essentially resisting the forces against your body from, you know, your inertia or whatever. So the stronger you are, 
the more your ligaments and tendons will be able to resist that change, but also how much better you will be at changing that direction. So just general strength training and being stronger a person will make you better at the COD stuff and make you um, more resilient to injury, but also better at volleyball. And same with landing from high. So we talked about depth jumps and stuff before. You know, you should be doing plyometrics until uh, the recommendation is at least one and a half times or two times body weight squat uh, to below parallel at least. So hey. if you're strong enough, you know, if you're strong enough to do that, then you're in a good position to resist those changes. So being strong physically, especially in the lower body, will make a lot of difference to the first two and then the, the movement uh, thing. <laughs> those old movement things. That's on crap. Reliable websites by Nike Ram 2's workout.ie. They sell them. The ones that sponsor us for Spider, they sell them. They're in check. Very nice like Martin. Um, they sell work. They sell Ram 2's. There we go. I'm glad you said that because I was going to say it on a website. They actually sponsor the video. Jesus Christ. Okay. Is there any benefit to strengthening conventional or sumo deadlifting weightlifting away from competition? Sumo deadlifting, absolutely no, no way. Why be. would you do it? It's cheating deadlifting. A little bit of deficit, like the things I was doing with, um, with the belt kind of duck. That's not sumo deadlift. Maybe if you did duck deficit, a little bit of adduction. There, that, no. That's not a sumo deadlift. All right. So I think to answer the question, what you're thinking about there, uh, so obviously conventional deadlift there is a course for 100%. I think that would be obvious. But, but the sumo deadlift, a little bit of um, adductor training would actually not go straight for a lot of weightlifters because a lot of weightlifters don't do it specifically. You know, you see a lot of weightlifters when they come out of squats. You see a little bit in the valgus, but it's that valgus in terms of like, ooh, valgus is just like, that's a natural motion of kind of high bar squats sometimes, you know. You see that little kick in. Yeah. So in terms of training that, that area that you're thinking that I think he's thinking of that area that the skating right I think that area that area the groin area um training your gooch definitely is benefit so like stuff like kicking a plate in, or straight legged move your plate in out uh crowd bond <laughs> that's, that's I'm not just, sumo deadlift I'm, like that's, that's what he's thinking I know that's exactly I know that's what he's thinking um but in terms of actual sumo deadlift not really um for conventional deadlifts 100 percent there's yeah just being stronger at it is yeah. very beneficial um Okay, maybe a little niche. A lot of S and C stuff. Would you recommend for a fencer? This and he, coming up, and he caught me off because I wanted to make the fencer joke. I would have been like <laughs> a good fencer. strong swing of a sledgehammer. <laughs> uh, this is what a few people asked, or maybe it's just James multiple times. And I, I looked into this after one of the people Did asked you? last time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe yeah. should do a video. On it. Yeah, there is the loads thing, of the little swords, not the ones. Yeah. Are That's good. hilarious. That is very funny. I missed that. Um, James, there's loads of stuff you can do. What are... <laughs> I just want to talk about hitting posts with sledgehammers. But s &T, so things that are were popping up in the literature from what I could see were knee injuries in the, the trailing leg, I think they called it. They might have had a different leg or a different term for that. But basically when the lunge is going in and then retracting from the lunge again, they were looking at range of motion and particularly range of motion in like the, the standard lunge positions. There were, I must pull that up. We might do a video on fencing because I, I looked at some stuff. Um, Fence, there's surely fencers against the sea. There is, yeah. yeah we'll do that. There were some adductor tears as well. I imagine there would be lunging under. Yeah. And I, it, I'd still feel a lot of them can do any kind of strength training. Basically. Yeah. They're probably aerobically very fit. Um, when I think of fencing, I think of James Bond. You know, yeah. That's what I think of. Yeah. So I'd say like any unilateral stuff, um maybe sumo deadlifts might actually be useful here. Um so another any, fencing question. Hang on. So uh Cossack squats or sideline lunges as some people call them. Um a little bit of plyometrics would not go astray, given that you know you're mm, absolutely you're lunging into it. So like any unilateral stuff in, in multiple directions, so forward and backwards, left and right, in it forward and back in time, um any spit squats. Um, just good old fashioned back squats would be phenomenal for resisting that. Side planks, starfish planks are favorite of fits. Um, weighted side planks would be good ones, I would stuff in there. Um, I feel don't, like don't tell them all the answers now because we find the program. I feel, I feel like, um, weighted pull ups would be a good one as well. So, like, a lot of upper body strength would be very useful, obviously, without restriction range of motion and in terms of conditioning. Yeah. The world's your oyster. Yeah. Uh, Philip says, would you be able to design a program for someone into fencing, uh, but also enjoys casual weightlifting? Absolutely, we would. Uh, but I we have, have to, to see. Hang on a second. Document. 
just to be clear, uh, we don't actually do one-off programs for people. Oh, no. Because that could we be only do coaching. So that's a good question, actually, Philip. So a lot of people ask us, can we design a program? Um, funny enough, what a lot of times people mean is, can we coach them, you know? So can we do one-to-one -one coaching, which fits with definitely do that for you, no problem. But uh, we don't ever do a one-off program for people in terms of, like, specifics. Uh, what you can do is a consultancy call. You usually have um, a couple of those people just want to talk to us for an hour about their training and designing stuff for them. Uh, but Fit would definitely do. Um, yeah, one to one coaching for sure. Um, like I'd love that, yeah. I love a, a novelty niche sport. Mm -hmm. What are the benefits in training six to nine times a week versus three to five times a week for Olympic weightlifting? Is more always better, Shane McGowan? Yes, it is, but <laughs> yes, it is, but <laughs> will you be able to handle it? Yeah, what can you tolerate? So ultimately, the goal of all training, like every sport in the world, is to do much as possible. Uh, like do as is, uh, as much training as you can possibly do. The more volume you can do, the better. The more you'll adapt to it. But however, within reason, you know. So most people six to nine times a week will end up getting injured unless you really tight it, trade into it over a course of several years. In our experience, most hobbyist amateur weightlifters four to maximum five times a week is the most people can handle before they explode. Um, so for for most people, four to five is the sweet spot. Um, but then if you're a full-time lifter, uh, it's not even a drugs thing. It's just time no. and recovery and the other activities going to living life. So someone like Yasmin, she trains, is it, she trained nine times a week or more, is it? Yeah. She trains a lot and, um, so, you know, you, you can do it, but her whole life, she's a professional weightlifter, essentially. It's just so weird thing with professional weightlifter without drugs, isn't it? It's, yeah. You have to say it as a caveat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So more is better, but more can you handle is the question. Um. Nice here in Australia. Where did Sika come from? Is it an Irish word? Sika is a type of deer. Uh, this deer, a deer. I can't adjust the camera name, but the one that's in our logo. It's a Japanese breed of deer. It's a Japanese breed of deer, yeah. Um, Very aggressive, narky little fuckers. So, some dude in the 1800s brought over a herd of Sika deer from, it was either Japan, I think it was from Japan, but they live in East Asia as well. Brought them over and they just, just, there was zero, so they're made for running from tigers, and there was surprisingly enough no tigers in Ireland when they came over, no. not in the 1800s, and there was no bears left, and maybe a few wolves, but not many, and essentially they've just... They've just done well? <laughs> they've bred like rabbits, Yeah, and there's a lot of them in Ireland. They've bred like an invasive species. Um, okay, what's the best protocol from coming back from six months out of the gym? Should you bother testing 1RMs? Uh, don't bother testing 1RMs. Uh, you don't even need to t to estimate one rms because you don't really. That's not where you need to start. Like you'll have a fair idea of what you could do today if you really, really wanted to. Uh, if you're a weightlifter and you're looking for the best place to start, the best place you should start. Where is that, Gert? That's seekastrength.com. Go to the getting back to training weightlifting program. It's thirty euros. It will get you back to being able to go straight into a normal weightlifting program. After four weeks, loads and loads and loads of people have run it now at this point. So Literally thousands of people. Yeah. So run that. For all of you who still aren't getting back into a gym and you just want to train at home, you can do, we have two training at home blocks. They're completely free. And thousands of people have run those. Fucking thousands. We've literally given away thousands and thousands of euro worth the free programs over COVID. So... Go on the website, have a look at those. That's where I would start. Don't bother testing. Uh, what program did Ewan use to scow out at 300 kilos? Well, he didn't None use any because he didn't do 300. The, the squat went to 90. Um, so the program fits. Just talk about the Road to Your Back Club program. Um, Seekstrength.com. Uh, you can put a link in there, actually, can you? Sure can. Uh, say something. So can the off-season program be tweaked to be more emphasis on fitness? Can I... I think I message. I don't know. You obviously need to get the link first. Um, you answer the question, I'll, I'll get the... Uh... Okay. Can the off-season athlete program be, be tweaked to have more of an emphasis on fitness? The real question here is, like, what kind of fitness are you looking to elicit? So, obviously, we typically think of two. So, the first one would be a field sports athlete or a general sports athlete or real sports athlete. And the second thing then will be a fitness athlete, as in CrossFit or some sort of strength and conditioning sport. 
if you were a real sport athlete, certainly, but you wouldn't really be tweaking it. So what you'd be using would be your off-season athlete program will be your gym sessions and your fitness sessions will be done on the field or on the court or on the track. What you may need to do is the tweaking of it will be you would run it as a three-day week program versus a four-day week program. That three-day week program would then last you five weeks instead of four weeks because you would push day four from week one in as and make that your day one from week two. And then your day three and four from week two would become day one and two from week three. So you just keep pushing it on, run it like that. That's about as much tweaking as you would need to do. If you're in the second camp, so the fitness athlete, CrossFit athlete, what you would do is you wouldn't run the off-season strength and hypertrophy program. You would run the Sika Strength for Fitness Athletes program. Your tweaking for that will be slightly different because we wouldn't want you to be moving those sessions around too much. But what you may need to tweak is the overall volume within the sessions. So you might just need to pull back a small bit on the accessory work if you were doing wads on the same session. And um, what we usually recommend with that is if you're going to be doing a lot of workouts or longer term workouts while running that program, you might need to take two or three of the last exercises within the session, which are typically just accessory work, and you will add them into your wad. So you might have like lunges and pull ups as accessory work. You would then do a workout that had lunges and pull ups in them. Okay. <clears throat> I really need to go to the toilet. There you go. Um, hello. I have an issue that my snatch is catching my cleans. Thank you, a difference. Should I do a lot more volume on clean to improve it? I keep snatch to the back. So I would never recommend um, removing emphasis from you know your, your one lift if it's doing well. So if your snatch is continually progressing, I wouldn't change what you're doing because you never want to stop progress. That's the main thing. Uh, Nishka, uh, Limbu. So I would say in terms of cleans, you just need to look at what's causing your clean to not progress. Is it a not enough volume? Is it poor technique? Is it not enough strength? Uh, is it a combination of two those? Do you have poor technique and you're not strong enough to do the bigger cleans? I would say probably, pro I would assume in this case, it's probably strength issue if you're able to snatch uh, within 10 kilos of your clean. It sounds very, very likely that it's a strength thing. Also, probably if you're just a beginner as well, uh, your technique is probably poor. So I would say, don't stop progress your snatch if you find something that works for it. But I would say uh, look at what's holding back your clean. So the poor technique are squats. Um, all time favorite weightlifters. Um, so obviously not great press in the last few months, but Nick Uvalad, so Gabriel's old coach, probably one of my favorite lifters. He did like 200.5 and 100 kilo body weight snatch. Clean job 230, 235 or something like that at 100 kilos. A phenomenal lifter. Um, who else? Um, Elia is probably up there as well. They're probably the two that come to mind in terms of all time favorite lifters. Um, when you guys are probing, probably hype trophy work for an athlete in an off season, do you progressively overload the exercises, increasing volume or intensity? So, um, do you progress strengths the same way you would in terms of uh, any kind of form of strength training? So, in terms of like the, the compound lifts. Sometimes the volume will be increased, but mostly we look for increased intensity. However, the volume for a kind of off-season athletes typically stays a little bit higher than it would for um, a, than it would for kind of strength athletes. So, for for example, some of Fitz's rugby players would stay at a uh, kind of moderate sets and reps. So they'd say with something around fives. Um, he'd never really push any of the players to kind of you know singles or doubles. Uh, sometimes Fitz likes to do things where he increases the volume on assistance work, so you'd increase the reps instead of increase the intensity, and then, um, but he'll still progress them through looking for heavier weights in terms of intensity, but maybe not drop the reps so much. And um, Samuel Toulmans. Um Adam White, hi guys, what are your thoughts for experienced natty lifters doing a recount for Betty Body Composition? Do you think it's a good shout or better to a more traditional bulk cut cycle? Um, in my experience, uh, it just hits Maddie lifters really hard, recomposition. It just really fucking, for some people, weightlifting in particular, it just nails weightlifting. Um, people just, it's very, very difficult. So I think mentally and psychologically, you need to be prepared to basically make no more progress and lose some stuff off your lifts and lose some amount of stuff on your back squat as well, I think. 
Uh, but the best way to go about it, there's no real way to do, you know, recomposition. Uh, I've not seen, probably the best thing you can do is hire a nutritionist and that will smooth out as much of the case as possible, uh, I would think. Okay, I copied Sisman Klecki's clean technique. My clean went from 130 to 146 in a few months. What are your thoughts on copying elite athletes with similar builds to you? I don't like it. Um, generally, I think what, what most people need to do is they need to find a technical model that they agree with, like the German model, the European model, whatever that is, and you aggressively chase that technique and that model, try and make yourself as technically perfect as you can possibly be. Then when you get to the point of being at a level of almost surpassing that, try and make those technical tweaks that you may need to make. And that may need to be changing your stance slightly, that might need to be changing your grip slightly. But I don't like, this is one lifter, I'm going to lift exactly like they are, because nobody's exactly the same as anyone. Um, that's like a super chat. Um, What's that super chat? What other seminars might you offer? So, uh, Dead Possum 66. Um, <laughs> If you're talking about the master classes, so we'll be doing literally any kind of topic we've ever done in the video, just a lot more depth. If you talk about in real life, uh, we do weightlifting seminars. We've done like general strength seminars. Uh, we'll, we can do strength for athletes. We're going to be doing some coaching staff education seminars in person. So for gyms where we do seminars at, we're going to do um, so just educating the staff in particular about specific subjects. So like strength training or weightlifting. I get a lot more in depth of programming, you know, uh, would be what we offer. Uh, what's it one's height and weight? What are you fight for? It's always two hundred and eighty kilos. It's always the height with you. You always you love to bring it in like you love He that. asked it, Muhammad Al Mawali. I am five eight and I think I'm hundred kilos now. I haven't weighed myself in more than a year, I'd say, so I'm not entirely sure. Um uh, love you guys. We love you too, Gunner. Hey lads, really enjoyed your recent React video. I've got narrow stance a bit like Ivan Jurek, and I noticed that you recommended widening it a bit. Can you please elaborate on why? Because I feel that at least in Ivan's case, he leans forward a bit too much. And I'm wondering if forward lean is related to narrow stance. Thanks, love your content. The issue with the narrower stance is mainly a recruitment and a biomechanical issue. So when you have a narrower stance, Gurf referred to this last week as not being able to get your hips out of the way or your legs out of the way of your hips. But basically what you're doing is you are limited by forward knee travel. So your knees or your dorsiflexion in your ankles is limited. You have to keep, keep pushing your knees forward in order to get your hips back and below parallel. The whole thing of a everything you do in your squat is about keeping that center of mass over your base of support. So the more you want to get your hips back, the further those knees have to come down and forward. In the case of Ivan, when Ivan is just pushing his knees forward, he then runs out of space for his knees to go forward and his hips have to go back because the hips are no longer traveling forward with the knees. And then he has to lean forward in order to keep his center of mass over his base of support. When you bring your feet a small bit wider and toe out a small bit, you're not then limited just by dorsiflexion because you can externally rotate your hips. You then get more room to bring your hips over your heels and you can stay a bit more upright. All right, next question for you as well, actually, from Sean. Sean says, started block, powerlifting block two about four weeks ago was suffering. You advised, you already advised cardio, it's helping a lot. Got two weeks in and my mental fortitude fell off a cliff. Uh, tips for keeping mentally sharp during, during tough blocks. Uh, it all starts off with your priorities, like what are your list of priorities? Granted, if you're not a professional athlete, or even if you are a professional athlete, physical training can be quite difficult to prioritize and making that your number one priority. For a lot of people watching this, they'll have no real grasp over how difficult it is to lose motivation completely. Well, what I'd start with, Sean, is I'd start with listing down a, a, or writing down a list of what you actually want to train, what you actually want to achieve with your training. 
are you just training because you've been training for the last three years and it's kind of what you do and you might be slightly linked in with your identity to your powerlifter you go to the gym just write it down get it down on paper maybe pull from that list of priorities then a small number of goals that you want to achieve uh, start off with something short term so if your number one reason for training or one of your priorities for training is that you want to squat 200 kilos pull that out derive that out or simplify that out into five or six different goals so part of squatting 200 kilos might be that you need to do a double at 190 kilos might be that you need to do 10 reps at 180 kilos whatever that might be start spreading those things out and the more you spread it out or or expand that laterally the easier it's going to be for you to kind of chip away through things and that is one of the biggest things we start seeing when people start like having your motivation fall off a cliff is that they don't really see the process at all they're just seeing an outcome and when you're having to smash cardio and smash your powerlifting training seeing that outcome it can be quite long long ways away uh okay hi guys would you make a cognitive training video i see there are many athletes uh who do not train the neurological part yeah we do seek a psychology videos fairly regularly there's a seek psychology video going up this evening the issue with cognitive training obviously is it, that's like saying will you guys do a physical strength or just it'd be like a physical training video so there's a huge number of things come into it it'd be like the same thing with cardio strength work power work speed work mobility work you have a vast number of things weighing into your cognition and how it affects your training so we will keep chipping away if you have specific things you'd like to see on the cognitive side of things pop them in here or just pop them into the comments of some of the videos um <clears throat> What is super chat? I wonder. Oh, uh, you know, I think on the on the neurological. So I know you're not. I know you say cognitive and you said neurological, but in terms of neurological stuff, and uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff coming out lately. But it's like really like, I'd say it's probably the least understood. Yeah. Part of maybe training and maybe part of the human body at the moment in terms of training, like is in reference to just training, uh, the neurology of stuff. You know, we've all heard about. Um, Stuart McGill talks about some very interesting stuff, so I'd love to get him on the podcast at some point to talk to him about it to see if we can get him uh, where they talk about like neurological stacking and things that are very that are things that are legitimate, but they're just a bit out there at the moment. So we'll watch with interest how they yeah. progress. Um, I had three heavy sessions day after day at work. I have another today, and I want to die. How much strength should we start taking? You should start thinking about zero. Take a rest day um, <laughs> is the main one. Should take a load of sleep. 500 milligrams of sleep an hour. Uh, okay, just dropping in to mention that I've been listening to HMMR Media Podcast recently. There's some great content. Um, I don't know what that is. Is, is he trying to plug another podcast? No, he's not. That would sound a lot of video. Electro HMMR Media Podcast. I've never heard of that. Medball Madness. I don't like some of this. What does HMMR no okay, we're gonna have to wrap this up soon. Um, my low bar squat is so much better than my high bar, but I prefer high bar. Question after my main work is five by ten or more squats for accessory work. After my main work is five by ten of more squats for accessory work sufficient. After your main working sets, so assuming you're in some moderate, moderate phase and, and your main working sets look like five by five at 75%, you shouldn't be going and doing five by 10 of any kind of squats. Um, if you need to do, so if you want to get a better high bar squat, right, you're, it's very, very likely that you're limited by both strength in the anterior chain and mobility. So it might be ankle mobility, hip mobility, whatever it is. And it's very likely you have weak quads. What I would be doing is after you do your main working sets, go and do something like front foot raise split squats, maybe belt squats, keeping the reps high, building volume, doing some actual quad hypertrophy work, and then slowly building it in. But the last thing I do after I did five by five on back squats, the last thing I do is do five by 10 um, of more back squats. Okay, um, I'm just gonna stop at a random question, okay? From 
Still 200 minutes. So, okay. What am I on? Okay, did your press and backstop oh, programs that was unbelievable. simultaneously and went from 140, that was very good. That's unbelievable. 140 to 147 on back squat and 120 to 127 and a half on bench press. Unreal. My back squat hence is ridiculously weak compared to my bench. What are we on there? That was just a nice comment. Best tips for periodized hypertrophy training block. Uh, Jesus, they're, that's, they're that's, two big words. That's a fucking deep question, Robert, for... For the last question of the live stream, but it's a great one. Let's go again. No, 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 that's no. A video. That's like ours. Best tip. When is me to seek a merch back? Um, no, we don't know the answer. There's no point telling. We answer. keep telling people the end of July, but we don't know. Um, there are samples on the way for some stuff. Um, but when I'll be back and on sale, we just honestly don't know. Um, it's surprisingly difficult to get good stuff and get it sorted. So, uh, all right, we could actually help someone with this. Okay, okay. Anywhere in Dublin, you'd recommend getting experience in S and C areas, so like sports science student, mostly in interested in individual sports, example, swimming, T and F, track and field, cycling. Where I would go, if, if you were my nephew or something, I would say go to Santry Sports Clinic and try and get in with one of their strength and conditioning coaches. What it's going to do is it's going to get you in with really highly qualified strength and conditioning coaches who are working with actual real humans who are athletes. It's also going to get you a range of a broad range of, of people. So you'll have everything from GA players to soccer players to uh, moms who play tennis and fell over and hurt their knee. And you're going to get a very, very good network of highly qualified professionals who you will know. I'm not sure if that's a possibility. I'm not sure if that's something you're interested in, but that's where I would start. And the second place I would go is uh, looking for like the UCB sports setup. So although it might be hugely active during the summer, they do have a lot of teams and they have a lot of professional paid coaches who work with those teams. So that's where I go. Sorry, no, but Ben Martin says, just before we finish, said, favorite pro rugby team, Ben, your boat Leinster guys. Is he, is he ben, having a laugh? Do us a favor, now. Joke, Do us. me a favor. Sure. A long walk off a shark cliff. Yeah, a long walk off a shark pier will be a good one. Um, how often do you guys hit the points? <laughs> well, 50% of us hit the points very regularly. Um, but uh, We both like points, to be fair. Yeah. Some of us just have the priorities. Gurf just enjoys training, and I enjoy having the crack. I, I like when I was training, yeah. I didn't drink for like four months. So from New Year's, <laughs> that's outrageously long. I didn't drink. So basically, after New Year's Eve, I didn't drink until after I finished my attempt at the five minute mile and five hundred pound squat. But ever since then, because I'm not training for anything, I've been hitting the points every so often. But Monday or Saturday training again, aren't you for something? Yeah, five foot opens. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Sorry, yeah, I forgot. But I can still drink a bit when I'm doing that. Uh, okay, <laughs> okay right. we are training with Clarence soon. Yeah. Okay. Nice, guys. How often do you guys hit? Oh, yeah. It's Clarence, Clarence is T-Total, yeah. Go to seekstrength.com if you would like training programs. If you're looking for some one-to-one -one coaching, you can go and inquire through there. That'd be great. Um, or a consultancy and seminars. You know where to find us. Thanks, guys. You know, when I clean this 250, um, 